Today's video takes us all the way back to the golden year of 1990. Before Monster High, but after Scooby-Doo and the Cool School, there were a few little-known movies called Little Shop of Horrors, Ghostbusters, and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. These movies actually play a major role in today's topic, and as an added bonus, this particular topic is right up our alley. Comedy, monsters in high school, corny jokes, goofball characters, a cool setting, some slightly mature context, and somewhat dated material. These monster cliches aren't a part of just any high school cartoon. This one was unique. Hey, 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 what's up everybody and welcome back to Macabre Gorham Labs presents School of Boredom, a showcase of things likely forgotten. My name is Bats and I'll be your guide today as we discuss today's topic with Lesson 202, Gravedale High, the original ghoul school. Oh, the school bells are ringing, now it's time to begin. Based on the title of this video, you may be asking, what do Little Shop of Horrors, Ghostbusters, and Honey I Shrunk the Kids have to do with Gravedale High? Well, they all have one thing in common, and it's not that they are horror or sub-horror property. Nope, in fact, it's that they all star the always amazing Rick Moranis. Gravedale High, or as it is sometimes known, Rick Moranis' Gravedale High, was a short-lived animated series from 1990 that was produced by Hanna-Barbera for NBC. During its run, it only had a total of 13 episodes and would air during the NBC Saturday morning lineup. This show would be set in a macabre high school where a slew of students based on then-current versions of Hollywood monsters, which we will be discussing in detail shortly, and their human teacher live everyday cartoon lives. Most of the episodes consisted of the characters dealing with dilemmas and sometimes moderately relatable tropes of growing up, with usual cartoon format wrapping it all up by the end of each episode. Along with a good variety of characters, this show had an all-star cast, some of which I wasn't even aware of till I wrote this script. I mean, all our favorites show up in this one, but whatever, let's take a look at them. An important note here is that most of the teachers are just teachers with no specific topic or specialty. So first up, we have Maxwell, or Max Schneider. He is the aforementioned human teacher and arguably the main character of the show. Max was voiced by Rick Moranis, and I guess he's supposed to be styled after the actor as well. I mean, you can see it, but also he looks kind of unlikely and lanky. But ironically, the character does not act the way he looks. In fact, he's actually quite headstrong, hardworking, dedicated, supportive, and not intimidated by his monster students or fellow staff. He shows no fear or discrimination to or about his job or the colorful cast of characters, which I will admit is a nice change of pace from how most of these kind of cartoons would have handled it. Most of the time in these shows, the teachers or humans involved were scared, timid, nervous, or at risk of being done in by the cast. According to the story, Maxwell got this job somewhat by accident, as he didn't know that the teacher job he was applying for was for a school for monsters. You can tell that Rick Moranis took his role for this show very seriously, but I'm sure he'll pop up in a school boredom spotlight at some point, so let's get on to the rest of the monstrous cast. Now, back to the teachers. Next up, we have Headmistress Crone. Headmistress Crone was voiced by Georgia Brown. This one is another weird situation where the character design does not fit the character, but somehow it still worked. And at first glance, you'd think that she would hate Maxwell for being human, but according to the story, it's quite to the contrary. In fact, she is the one that hired him in the first place. Reluctantly, but she did hire him. She is shown as very stern and firm, but also very supportive of Maxwell and his methods. Headmistress Crone also has a pet cat named Clawford, who can be seen throughout some of the episodes doing macabre Tom and Jerry style encounters with a mouse named Bella. Headmistress Crone is a witch type creature with an iron hand that can actually be removed for a variety of reasons. Oh, I see what they did there. She's super strict and has an iron fit. Yeah, okay, I got it. Now let's see. Okay, next we have Coach Cadaver, voiced by the amazing and fondly remembered Jonathan Winters. Rest in peace. 
This character is in direct contrast to Headmistress Crone. Unlike her, he does not like Maxwell, the fact he's a human, the fact that he works at Gravedale High, or how supportive the rest of the cast is. He shows no support for Maxwell and always hopes to see Maxwell fail. Coach Cadaver is designed after a traditional zombie complete with a removable brain. And if you didn't already guess, he is the high school coach. Based on his character design, you could assume he was at one point a prisoner that probably died in his cell due to the chained cuff he has attached to his wrist and the outfit he wears. From time to time, it seems he tries to impede Maxwell's efforts, and he speaks in a gruff and grumbly voice, one that the talented Jonathan Winters was actually well known for. I was... I was a strange child. We were? Mm. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I used to get up on the top of the barn with the pigeons. <laughs> and, you know, just... <laughs> You'd better get moving, too, or you're gonna miss seeing my star gargoyle fly the wings off your bat boy stoker. <laughs> Next up, we have Boneyard voiced by Brock Peters. There isn't a whole lot to say about him. His design is similar to a graveyard keeper. He's pretty much the guy that does odd jobs like driving and running machinery. Then we have Miss Dirge, voiced by Eileen Brennan. This character is based on the Bride of Frankenstein and has the hots for Maxwell. There really isn't a whole lot else to say. The next teacher on our list is Miss Webner. As if it wasn't obvious, Miss Webner is a spider-like monster that has six arms, two legs, and is going to be glossed over right now. Chef Sal Manella. This monster isn't really designed after a famous monster. He just kind of does his own thing. But he is the school chef and believes his cooking to be top-notch. And the last of the teachers, Mr. Tutner, voiced by the one and only Tim Curry. Mr. Tutner is a 5,000-year-old mummy, but despite being 5,000 years old and a mummy, you know, basically a dehydrated human wrapped up in rags, he is a little on the heavy side, as with most of the monsters on this show, he is in direct contrast to the normal tropes of the movie monsters. Mr. Tutner is the school's history teacher, and despite his trademark horrible breath, he gets along well with Maxwell. But what good are teachers without the students, and our first student is Frankentag, man. If it isn't obvious, this character is a smallified version of the infamous Frankenstein's monster. Frankentike is the result of taking Frankenstein's monster and every 1980s little tough guy cartoon character and putting them in a blender. Just like the character he's based on, he was created in a lab and consistently in sentences or refers to people with man. You did invite him, didn't you, Frankentike? Well, sure I did, man. Next up, we have Vinny Stoker whom was voiced by the always entertaining Frank Welker. Vinny is the show's resident vampire character. He is themed after a greaser or Arthur Fonzarelli with maybe a little Breakfast Club's bender thrown in. Vinny is shown wearing a leather jacket, blue jeans, coiffed hair, and with the cliché speech type that comes with it. His name is a homage to the author, Bram Stoker. Vinny is one of the more prominent characters featuring in the bulk of the stories. Just like all of the students, Vinny has a fondness for Maxwell and sees him as a teacher who cares. Next up on the list, we have Vinny's best friend and the show's resident werewolf character, Reggie Moonshroud, and he was voiced by Barry Gordon. While watching this show, I have come to agree with the wiki here. While Reggie is somewhat of a geek, and hey, no shame here, we're right there with him. He is the kind of character you might find in Revenge of the Nerds, only he's a werewolf. But unlike other werewolves, he does not have feral instincts. In fact, he is instead well in control of his emotions and his own nature, usually providing logical conclusions to the problems the characters would face. Next up, we have Gil Waterman, voiced by, and I was personally surprised by this one, Jackie Earl Haley. That's right, the guy that played Freddy Krueger in the reboot of Nightmare on Elm Street and Rorschach in The Watchmen, also voiced this guy. Here on my new fan-powered skateboard. 
uh, Gil. As you can see, this character is what you get if you mix the creature from the Black Lagoon with a 1950s beach bum or surfer dude from almost any era. He's a very dude sort of character. He's always hungry with an appetite that cannot seemingly be fulfilled. Next up is J.P. Gastly III. He would also be voiced by the amazing Frank Welker, who was impersonating Peter Lorre, another actor from the 1920s. J.P. doesn't really have a monster type either, but I would say that he resembles an Igor-style character. Although he is already wealthy, he is motivated by a desire to become even more wealthy so that Blanche will fall in love with him, as it is her goal to marry the wealthiest monster ever. Blanche is a high-maintenance southern lady, gal, woman... Bass, I believe the word you're looking for is Southern Belle. Thanks, that's actually perfect. Blanche is a Southern Belle. She is designed to be a zombie woman or girl, and her primary interests are being dramatic and spending money. Like, a lot of money. Also, she has some debt due to her shopping habit. Moving on, we then have Sid. Sid was voiced by the absolutely amazing Maurice LaMarche and was based on the Invisible Man. This would make an interesting character study because while the character is invisible, he can't seem to get enough attention. He is constantly being obnoxious, doing impressions and other acts of comedy that would garner attention as opposed to his counterpart, the actual Invisible Man, who prefers to remain unseen. Heading into the final stretch, we have Doozer voiced by Kimmy Robertson. This is what you get when you imagine Medusa in her teenage years, if those years were in the late 1980s and Doozer was a valley girl. 1980s valley girls. They weren't cool then, they aren't cool now. I could track every girl west of Van Nuys Boulevard. So this character is somewhat shallow and her character's name is actually Medusa, with Doozer being a nickname. An important note is that she does not seem to have the same turn you to stone powers that are common with Medusa's. And aside from being boy crazy, she seems to be really fond of the phrase, get a life. Especially when she feels like someone's ticking her off. Get a life, Cleo. I want you to write about food, not eat it. Remember earlier when I said that this was dated? Well, please keep that in mind, as I did not write this show or have anything to do with it. I'm just talking to you about it. For historical sake. That being said, let's talk about Cleopatra. No, you did not mishear me, unfortunately. I said Cleopatra. She was voiced by none other than Ricky Lake. Yes, the Ricky Lake from the original 1988 movie Hairspray and her stupid pandering talk show from the 90s. It's not that she was specifically stupid, just all talk shows are stupid. Sorry, I'm just not a fan of talk shows or reality TV pretty much to any extent. Sorry. Very similar to the Mr. Tutner's character, Cleopatra was unlike other mummies, as she was a plus-size mummy. She was kind of a geeky or nerdy character that is almost carbon copy of characters of her genre from that era, complete with a celebrity crush. She is really kind of a sweetheart and prefers to go by the nickname Cleo. She's often shown to be really good friends with Doozer. Before and during writing this, I sat down and rewatched all episodes. Silly as it was, I didn't really find myself bored with it. The stories are fun and silly with a lot of corny gags and tons of puns. And a little humor some people might find in bad taste. Like I said, this show had 13 episodes in total, so let's take a look at them now and go through a quick run through. Episode 1, Long Day's Gurney into Night. In this episode, Sid gets sick, so Max takes him to the community hospital since there is no school nurse anymore. Episode 2, Do the Rad Thing. Gil is teaching Frankentyke to surf when he meets a professional surfer named Kahuna Bob. Gil wants to drop out of school to be a professional surfer like Bob. Episode 3, Cleo's Pen Pal. Cleopatra is a huge fan of monster actor Billy Headstone, so she sends him a letter. Much to her surprise, she gets a reply with a date invite. The problem is Cleopatra sent him a photo of Doozer and said it was her. Episode 4, Monster Gumbo. 
Max's class is in competition with Coach Cadaver's class in a charity fundraiser event for the United Monster Fund. The class wants to use Blanche's secret family recipe for gumbo to win. Episode 5 The Dress Up Mess Up It's Max's birthday so the kids all chip in so they can get dinner at an expensive restaurant for him. Doozer wants to be in the Gravedale fashion show so she persuades Cleopatra into lending her birthday money in order to buy a new dress. Episode 6 The Grave Intruder the school newspaper, the Gravedale Gazette, is taken over by Doozer, and she changes it into a gossip rag. Episode 7, Fear of Flying. I've never seen Vinny pull that stunt before. It's no stunt, Mr. Schneider, sir. Vinny's lost his ability to fly. For the science fair, Reggie's project, space rat wings, which are wings that can be attached to someone that doesn't have them, Vinny and Reggie go outside to test said wings. Reggie awkwardly heads into the air and ends up hitting Nardo. Episode 8 He Ain't Scary, He's My Brother We are introduced to Frank and Tyke's older brother, Big Frank, when he takes time off from his funeral business. Episode 9 Frank and Jockey this one involves a horse named Hoover who escapes from his owners, Colonel Saddlesore and Liverpool. Episode 10, Save Our School. Because Vinny is flunking civics, Max says he has to run for student body president so he can learn the importance of government. Episode 11, Night of the Living Dad. This episode brings us to the Gravedale Talent Show, which the students' parents will be attending. Frankentike doesn't want the class to know that he has a human father, so he builds a fake dad to come to the talent show instead. Episode 12, Goodbye Gravedale. This episode involves a lot of crossed wires, because as Max's class is producing a class movie, they find an acceptance letter for Max to become a teacher at Midtown Prep School, a school for humans. Naturally, this results in several misunderstandings. And Episode 13, Monster on Trial. We see from the driver's ed class that Reggie is not driving very well and causes Boneyard to stop teaching it at all. So, as expected, Max decides to do it. So, as you have seen with an all-star cast, this show was pretty good for what it was, and it does not need a reboot. I repeat, does not need a reboot. I highly recommend going to check it out for yourselves. I watched every episode right here on YouTube, and there's a link in the description so you can check it out for yourselves. What are some of your favorite moments from this show, or any other show, or even suggestions for future videos? Let us know down in the comments section below. And with that, we've come to the end of another School of Boredom lesson. My name is Bats, and I hope you had fun today as we took a look at Lesson 202. Gravedale High, the original goal school. Be sure to check back next time because you never know what we have in the store. And as usual, think for yourselves, be excellent to each other, and keep it creepy. Hey, thanks for checking out our video. If you enjoyed this one and would like to see more of our weird, creepy, odd, eccentric, or strange content as soon as it comes out, please feel free to click like, subscribe, and turn on notifications for more. We'll see you later. Keep it creepy.